those of you who know me, I have a YouTube channel, Apologia. My name is Paul. It's pronounced Apologia usually. There was that Kent Hovind guy here earlier, and it may not have been the right one because he pronounced my channel name right. You know, but I, I really do like that Apologia fella. Uh, <clears throat> I don't even know if he's here. Show, show his face. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, he and, uh, he, he and that uh, Shannon Q, uh, well, of course, uh, neither of them know anything, but, uh, you know, uh, he's, he, he's a lot of fun to whack. Which is something that never happens by an apologist. Something suspect going on there. But if you watch my channel, you know that one of the things I normally do is react to stuff. That's sort of my crutch. I also hide behind a cartoon and a script. And when I feel like my content gets boring, I play a movie clip over my corner so that you guys all are entertained, even though I'm not talking about cool stuff. But we don't have any of that today. So we're in for what it's in for. Cleverly titled the Apologia Talk, because for a long time, I didn't quite know what I was going to talk about. Some of you may know that while Oz is an amazing, amazing person in thousands and thousands of ways, communicating with speakers isn't necessarily his strongest, strongest point. And at one point it was announced on his channel what my talk was going to be about, which was kind of fun. I was to talk about, well, we'll get to it. But I'm a strong believer in my career that true creativity actually comes from constraints, not from unlimited freedom. If you work like in movies, industries like I have, for example, when the more weird constraints there are, the more creative you have to be about solutions. So I didn't mind being given what my talk was, but I wasn't super comfortable with it. But then all of a sudden it was like, well, you speakers can talk about anything you want. And that was like bad news for me. So like we do in our house, whenever we don't know what to do, we turn to Twitter because Twitter is where all good decisions are made. So I turned to Twitter and asked them if, I, if they were to hear me speak live, what would they most want to hear me talk about? And so this one, for example, and the lights, I, we may not be able to read all this perfectly because the lights are kind of weird. Anyway, this, this particular person thought that my origin story would be a good thing, although I've spoke about that on many occasions, including since, you know, everyone's plugging Neil. I, there's a video where I've spoke about with Neil, so you can find that elsewhere. It's not always the most interesting thing. The Buddha, who's here, wanted me to maybe speak about family dynamics, which is maybe not a bad idea. And I love to talk about that. And maybe if there's question times or afterwards, you can ask me about that. Most of the people wanted this. The Star Wars, definitely Star Wars. For those of you who don't know, it was never my intention for it to bleed over into my channel, but I did used to work for George Lucas. And so I have lots of Star Wars stories, which if you get me drunk enough tonight, maybe you can hear some of those. Now, for those of you who are old school YouTube followers, you may recognize the name non-stamp collector. Now he replied, and I need to get this closer to me because I have to get the wording exactly right. The extent to which the ethics of deconstruction problematizes normative associations between subjectivity and textuality, please. So that's what we're going to hear tonight. No, we're not going to hear that tonight. Of course, we had the, the Christians chimed in because mostly Christians follow my Twitter. This particular person was a Christian and wanted to hear about why I deconverted back to Christianity, which is optimistic. But another Christian, you know, I think gave the best possible answer. Where does that manly aroma you give off come from? That's from Inspiring Philosophy. The thinking man's Christian. That was his answer for what we were going to talk about. So none of that was helpful. No surprise. So I went back to what Oz originally asked me to speak about, which is how to counter Christian apologetics. And I thought that was a terrible topic in the first place because it is such a niche thing. And I could just stand up here and spit out all the specific things that Christians say and the answers to it, but there's literally 2,000 years of literature on those finer points. And some of the books are thousands and thousands of pages long. I wasn't sure that I how to make the best use of our time for that. And I realized really it would narrow down to three very quick things anyway. So I'm gonna give those to you now so you're not shortchanged to the speech that Oz wanted me to give you. First source methodology when you're looking at a claim of a christian or really this applies to any religious claim just keep going backwards find the source the original 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 source and see where it says most of the time it's been taken out of context or it's a garbage source or the source is just someone made something most of my channel is literally just me being willing to either look up or buy or go to a library and find the book where the claim is found and it in context, it's garbage. Second, and I hate this answer, is you actually have to know a little bit about philosophy 
And we atheists are very bad at uh, two particular things. One is recognizing that we actually have presuppositions. For example, general reliability of our senses is a presupposition. We don't actually, we can't prove that in a non-circular way. And that's really all a presupposition, something you're holding that you admit is entirely circular. The Eric Hovens of the world, or the Ray Comforts of the world, you know, they say that we all know we believe in God, and that's their circular presuppositions, but we have them too. And so when we don't, we shortchange ourselves. And I'm sorry if I'm speeding through, I want to get to all the stuff. The other one, of course, is, oh, science. You can't just yell at the Christian that science is the only way we know things because science itself is a philosophical groundwork of how we study things. And so it hurts my heart when Christians just shout the word science to the Christian and think that answers anything. Because unfortunately, as much as I hate philosophy, we do need to know a little bit of it to combat. The other weird thing, it's come up a few times today. Dr. Josh mentioned it, for example. If you really want to get into this field, you have to know their arguments better than they do because the worst thing you can do is straw man them. And that's the entire reason my channel has, I just do responses because that way I can always show that well, that's not what Christians think. Well, one Christian does because that's who I'm replying to, right? That's like, I would have given a half an hour version of that if that was what, where the spirit led me. But those of you who are Christians know that was not what God, the non-God was laying on my heart to talk to you all about today. What I really wanted to do was steal from Christianity Yes, assume the missionary position. Apologists often accuse us of stealing from the Christian worldview. We steal morality. Sure, we're moral, but we, that's just because we steal from them. Or sure, we can be rational, but you can't be. God is the necessary for rationality. There's all kinds of things that they accuse us of stealing from them. But in the spirit of today, we've talked a bit about how Christians are really good at community and that that is something that we could learn from them from. There are things we can learn from the Christian church where they are successful and even where they fail. One of the things they are very good at, getting other people to believe their stuff. And that is something that I know that's the spirit of what I think that people want to be talking about, like counter apologetics, but getting winning deconversions. And I know, I think Dave's whole speech was like, we don't need to win deconversions. And I actually said, Shannon, well, my whole speech is how to deconvert people. So we're at counter purposes here. But if you want to deconvert people, we can look to the Christians and some of the things that they, and pardon me, I'm actually just going to go to Bible verses because it's what I'm most familiar with. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. And God has, and God has placed the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of teaching, healings and guidance, and different kinds of tongues. Now, we don't believe in any of that. I'm not on my channel. We don't believe any of that shit. I sometimes swear on occasion. What, is, what purpose does this have? Well, the reason I wasn't feeling super led to give the counter-apologetic speech was that I don't think very many of us need to be counter. It was said very well earlier by Seth that most Christians aren't Christians because of a particular piece of theology, that if you debunk that piece of theology, that it's going to fall apart for them. Now, for me, that 100% was what deconverted to me, and I know I've spoken to some of you that we were theology geeks and it was that made it fall apart. But that's not the majority of the Christians that you meet. Most of them don't think deeply about these issues. And that's the kind of Christian you see in the pews and then they maybe have lots of other reasons. So it doesn't matter if you have the best counter apologetics arsenal ever that, that that'll be effective. What we really need, and it's been talked about a bunch of times is diversity, but it's not just diversity of tactics. It's actually diversity of goals. Earlier, it was spoken of also normalizing atheism. I feel like that is our t that should be our top priority ahead of counter apologetics, because, for example, when I came out, when it was revealed to my family that I was an atheist, my my dad's biggest problem was like, I don't care if you don't believe in God, but do you really have to call yourself an atheist? Because for him, that was the weird pervert on the corner or something like that was just that's a label that we need to win back. And I know that's part of why we sometimes people fight so hard about these label definitions is because we really do want to reclaim atheism. And I know as a Canadian, I can observe what's happening here politically. It wouldn't it be great if there was a non-believer category that the government, act, that the government actually cared about trying to win their votes as a block. That would be great. All that said, I don't think everyone here is called to be a counter apologetics, but normalizing atheism and or correcting bigotry. So that has come up. Or I know you guys are going to be in for a big political fight here. Now that's going to be a whole new thing. None of that stuff involves disproving 
or proving who wrote the book of Mark. So I don't think that what I do, it, and I talk, spoke about that narrow focus. My narrow focus shouldn't necessarily be yours, and that's partly why I didn't want to talk about that. Let me do this next word. Also in 1 Corinthians, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who made things grow. Yesterday, one of you, and I've forgotten your name, I'm so sorry, came up to me at the party and said, I hate you, Pelagia, which is a great way to start off the interaction. And he said, I was working on my Mormon friend for months, giving them all the arguments. And they said, no, 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 no I'm not going to listen, not going to have, have any of it. And they lost contact with the person. And then a few, to, forgive me if I'm telling it slightly wrong, you can get all the details. But they came back a few months later and, and he said, you know what? I don't believe anymore. And he said, really, what happened? He said, well, I went and watched a bunch of Pelagia videos and now I don't believe anymore. And so that person had, in their mind, they had done a ton of work to get this person to deconvert. And then inadvertently, my videos were what pushed it across the finish line. That is something in Christianity, I feel like they do, they are smart to talk to their group about, it's a good, we're gardening and we do not know what the planting of the seeds or which watering or pulling a weed, all those things, we will never know which will be the thing that will ultimately win it. So we, and frankly, we need more gardeners than we need harvesters. And I know these are terms that come, for those of you who are Christians, these are terms, but they apply to us as well. And that whole deconversion system, again, the normalizing of atheism and the nor being someone that they can imagine themselves being, those are the bigger barriers than what year was Jesus born, which is what I talk about. Maybe you're wanting to talk about that as well. And maybe that's the thing that pushes someone over the line, but it didn't happen. I don't think that person would have left their faith if the person, whichever one of you was, I'm sorry, hadn't have done months of work and demonstrated some of that caring. So these are all things that we can learn from Christianity that we, it's not every one of us is going to drag someone to the finish line, but dragging them a foot closer is a foot closer. Another thing that when I was in Bible college, the only model of missionary work that there was in at least in my denomination, this weird old model where you would take a fresh 18 year old and you would teach them everything about the Bible for four to six years. And then you would send them on three or four years of language training because you're going to send them, you pick, they pick a country, you're going to send them to Brazil or Japan or China or somewhere where they, so I, you, I'm a Mennonite kid. This is just white as it gets, you know, we're going to send off, you know, these people who are culturally as American, a uh, white America as you get, or Canadian or Mennonite, and we're going to send them off to China, we're going to send them off to Brazil. And so we said they would spend years and years and years teaching them to be culturally sensitive and then send them over and then spend all kinds of and years just gaining the trust of the people over there or the African tribes or all these, you know, missionary stories that those were Christians grew up with. But this was, these were the heroes. This is what they did. Well, shortly after I graduated from Bible school, the Christians actually kind of figured this out. And this is what they do now. They find someone from Brazil. They don't, we're not going to send a white kid who doesn't know anything about life because he's been in Bible school his whole career. For, we're going to find someone from Brazil, bring them over, teach them the Bible stuff. So you don't have to teach them all the language, teach them all the cultural relevance. And they just teach them the Bible stuff and send them back. Well, why does that work? What does that have to do with anything here? I'm a Christian. When I started my channel, I used to get all kinds of comments about why aren't you talking about it? Why aren't you talking about Islam? Why aren't you talking about Catholicism? Why aren't you talking about spirits and all this other stuff? And I'm like, I don't know any of that stuff. And I really felt because of all the comments, especially Islam, I felt the weight on my shoulders that, well, maybe I need to go learn all that stuff. And it was through some conversations with the apostate prophet and a few people where it was like, no, I am the, I was culturally the Christian. And so I can go back and speak to them, but I would be terrible at speaking to other groups. That's relevant to us because I really feel like our pasts all give us a specific deconstruction mission field that we can work with. If you have specific trauma in your life, I know that's awful. And a lot of us have that trauma, but that trauma gives you a special perspective that I maybe don't have, or someone else doesn't have. Perhaps you came from Buddhism or you came from Islam. Those are things that I can't speak to. It's way better if we go back to the mission field where we came from, as opposed to trying to learn a lot of, learn all this other stuff so that we can go be ineffective 
and kind of laughed at it, a culture. This is a shortcut to, to go find, it's been spoken of several times here today already, but find that person that you were is one way to do it. Or find the person that is something you're passionate about. Maybe you're passionate about the soul or brains, or you might be passionate about who knows. Those are going to connect with a certain group of people. Don't fight, take advantage of the unique perspective that you have to deconstruct someone. Even if that's not the masses, it may not be sexy and cool, but you are equipped to handle something that I could never handle that the person next to us, no one on any of these panels could handle because of your unique situation. So go back and be those the missionaries to those people. And again, so that's similar, be your audience. Yeah, I do. I do want to read this one. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone so that I might win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like the one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So that those who, so that those under the law, to win those under the law, pardon me. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. So I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means, I might save some. That is, is a Christian answer. I know that goes a long way to speaking about us trying to blend in. Now, I have two points here. I'm just trying to keep it clear in my head. The first one is that absolutely what you have, if you watch my channel, you witness me speaking to myself in the past in the same way that I in the past would respond to. And that is one way of doing it because I put myself in that context. For example, I know that former me, if I heard someone say the F word, I wouldn't have listened to a single thing that happened after that, which is why I don't swear on my channel. But again, if you are speaking to a trauma victim, you need to speak in a certain way. If you're speaking to someone who is a jihadi Muslim, you, they have a whole different way of speaking that needs to happen to them. You really need to know that audience. The best way is bringing some of that for yourself. But one of the things that I feel like this passage is often under, misunderstood by Christians is that Paul was all of these things. Paul was Greek. Paul was a Jew. Paul was, he felt that he was under the law. He kept the Hebrew scripture, even though he insisted and fought Peter that other people didn't have to. Paul, at no point in this verse, in this passage, said that you need to be something that you are not. It just said, within who you are, within what you are, be conscious of who you're talking to. And I think that goes a long ways to what we've been speaking about today in terms of just being mindful. You don't know who's watching. Your, when you're fighting on Twitter, when you're doing all that stuff, you don't know who's watching and you don't know what they're going to receive. If you want to be effective in deconverting people, you need to tailor that message within who you are, not leaving outside your, not leaving outside your comfort zone, not trying to be disingenuous. I could never be heathen queen. None of us probably could, but that would be read as disingenuous instantly. That is never what this verse has said, even though I've heard many, many sermons telling us, telling Christians that they need to go and place themselves in situations they're not comfortable. Anyway, know your audience. Also, know your goal. Is your goal to be right? If your goal is to be right, then you are actually not in the deconversion business. And that is fine. I don't think that all of us need to be in the deconversion business. I don't think that's everyone's, necessarily everyone's calling. It's not necessarily everyone's goal. It is mine. And therefore, for me, if I ever just, if I think to myself that my goal is to be right, then I am not being effective. And I need to check myself on that all the time. Something you may or may not need to check yourself on as well. And again, going back to this verse, Paul ended it with, I'm by all things, I become all men or I become all possible things so that I might save some. And that is if you are wanting to decon deconvert people, I hope that is the reason you want to do this. Now, I don't know if he's here. I, and if he ever hears this, sorry, Clint, for telling this brief story. Yesterday, I met with my Bible school roommate. He was a groomsman of mine. I thought he was a brother. He considers my parents his parents. But when I deconverted, I did not hear a single word from him until yesterday. Now, we had a wonderful conversation. And we picked it up, and I think this relationship is going to be great. So thank you for that. That was a great opportunity, even just to be in Fort Wayne for that. But he told me he wanted to end our conversation with what he thought I was doing. He said, you know what, Paul, if I could have been the doorman at 9-11 and the Twin Towers, and I knew exactly what was going to happen. If I was the doorman and I let anyone come into the building, that would be 
a terrible, terrible mistake. And I would do everything in my power to prevent people from going into that building where I knew they would come to their doom. And he said, Paul, I am trying to stop you from doing that. And I realized in that moment, I said, you know, I am doing the exact same thing. I think that people have one life. We know, that's all we know. Maybe there's more, and that might be a great bonus, but we know we have one and only life. And if people are going to waste that one and only life in the tower, making decisions based on what I think are false ideas, and I think we, most of us in this room think that religious ideas are false ideas, and the reason they do harm is not always the idea itself. It's the mindset of using that kind of false ideas just to make decisions. How can that not harm you if you are using faulty information to make your decisions? I said, you know what? I am the same doorman trying to stop people from going into the building. And if that is not your motive to deconvert people, or that is my motive. And I feel like that's a strong one. And if you just want to deconvert people to win an argument or anything like that, you and I are completely on the same team, even though I'm sure we'll find things in common. But that's, it's just something to check. Two quick last things, and then I will be done. And these are random tips that didn't fit under a nice Christian category, except the first one, which is, I think I couldn't find the source for this statement, but I think Chris, Christians made it up. They don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I feel like we need to adopt that. Basically, we need to demonstrate that we care about the other person that we're talking about. So I kind of mentioned it a little bit here in the panel. I have made it recently. I've started to make a real issue, real try to find bonds for things outside of the thing we're disagreeing about so that we have some common ground to rely on to demonstrate that I care about the person more than I care about winning the argument. And this is advice that Christians give other Christians, and I think they're winning because of it. I don't feel like the atheist community often enough demonstrates that we care about the person more than the argument. So that is a tip for, from me. And here's the last one, which maybe it's controversial. You can come up and talk to me afterwards. You've heard me mention many times that I started my channel for my children. That was due to health circumstances, but I do not endorse making your family your mission field. If your family is going to deconvert, they don't need your help to do it from an argument perspective. What they need is, I think what Drew said earlier with his father, pardon me, Drew, if I mis mis misremembered, demonstrating to your family that you are still fundamentally the person that they know and love and that you care about them more than winning the argument is the only thing you need to do with your family. Please don't debate the hermeneutics with them or this kind of thing, unless that is a passion of theirs. So those are my last couple tips. Take them for what it's worth. But I do think that Christians have great ways of converting people and that some of those things that we can think we can steal. I did think we we're gonna have time for questions, but I don't think we are going to now. So find me later and ask me questions.